Now, I will start first uh, with drawing a comparison between the Ukrainian revolution that we are seeing before our eyes <clears throat> and the East European revolutions of 1989-1990. Uh, why this would be important? What you have seen on your screens uh, is pictures of extreme violence and uh, uh, it will be useful to try to establish why this violence has come about and why Ukraine um, is engaging in something that has not been seen um, from the end of 1989, say 20, 25 years ago, uh, on the streets of Bucharest. Uh, we haven't seen such extreme violence. So, now, um, to start with, the events in Ukraine, uh, whether we call the coup revolution or a combination of both, were directed against a government that, on the surface of it, was democratically elected. This, of course, is a great difference, a uh, big difference, uh, in comparison with the events of 1989-1990. Then, uh, the target were totalitarian communist governments, 1989-1990. Not so in Ukraine. The target was a democratically elected government. Now, of course, we have to delve a little bit further and, um, and say a few words about this particular government. This government on one side was democratically elected, on the other side uh, it was completely dominated by oligarchs. Anyone who has done, who has studied the uh, post-Soviet space um, would know what that means. Uh, Ukraine actually was an extreme example of uh, oligarchic domination. And it can be compared with um, what Russia was before Putin um, uh, at the time of Yeltsin in the 1990s, when basically there was a committee of oligarchs uh, from the mid-1990s and Yeltsin was, uh, uh, in many ways, their spokesman. And then, of course, Putin came, reigned in, um, selectively uh, on the oligarchs, um, uh, subverted them um, um, and uh, subordinated them to his own um, particular regime. This has not happened in Ukraine. And um, Yanukovych, in many ways, was like Yeltsin to these oligarchs. The problem, of course, was that um, Yanukovych was, um, what can I say with hindsight, was extremely avaricious and greedy and did not give much space uh, even to, um, to some of the oligarchs close to him. And then um, and there was a division within the, uh, within the oligarchs. Uh, some of the oligarchs decided that they can't really, really live with Yanukovych anymore because uh, he doesn't leave space to, to anybody. Uh, just a small vignette um, in Crimea in particular. There is a very uh, great resentment to this day and before the event uh, against Yanukovych, very great resentment, surprisingly so, because he's being uh, touted as the uh, pro-Russian president, as someone who fought for uh, Eastern Ukrainians, for the Russian speakers and all that, yet uh, in how he's seen in Crimea. In Crimea he's seen as basically the Donetsk gang or the Makhevka gang, uh, if one goes uh, more specifically into the Donbass region. So basically when he came to power, um, um, around um, uh, 2010, in Crimea in particular, because it was a, a, a peninsula famous for its resorts and all that. Um, so these Makhevka, Donbass people, uh, quite brutally established themselves in Crimea and eclipsed the local mafias, uh, which were quite um, prominent um, and, and quite brutal, but nothing like what uh, came from Makhevka and from uh, Donbass. Uh, the, like for three and a half years of, um, of uh, Yanukovych's um, uh, rule, mm, <coughs> uh, ten mayors in Crimea have either committed suicide uh, mm, officially or for some inexplicable reasons have thrown themselves out of windows. Uh, and this was just to illustrate how brutal the, the division of spores in Crimea was. So Yanukovych wasn't particularly liked even in the East. Uh, he wasn't, but he wasn't particularly liked in the West either. So uh, the oligarchs uh, uh, ganged up against him. Mm, he was left just with his own particular clan, uh, and um, uh, then the rest, um, as we can say, is history. So uh, to sum up, this was a democratically elected government, uh, but uh, oligarchic in in, um, uh, in its essence. Not a particularly lovable uh, bunch of people. Mm, and um, even Putin, uh, President Putin of Russia, has uh, said, uh, has admitted uh, twice publicly that the the Maidan, the people in Ukraine, had a point in rebelling against uh, against their government. So it was that brazen, 
Um, it, was, it was certainly brazen by Russian or, or, or post-Soviet um, standard, standards. So, now if we go further, uh, another thing that is quite striking uh, is how Ukraine descended um, into violence. Uh, I'm not going to go chronologically what happened, the, but um, uh, this was probably the time around February when I started wondering what exactly we are witnessing in Ukraine. Uh, this, this, there was extreme violence directed, uh, I mean, if it was violence just directed by the police against the demonstrators, that would have been understandable. Uh, this is what we see the world over. But what we have seen is extreme violence directed by demonstrators against the police. And we have seen, we have not seen the whole picture of, uh, of what was happening there. I mean, it is graphic, uh, exceptional violence when policemen are being burnt um, uh, with Molotov cocktails and when they're being um, um, uh, kicked to the ground, beaten to pulp and all these things. Mm, quite exceptional violence. And the people behind this violence, well, in some ways this is uh, perhaps the most interesting thing, something that has not happened in 1989, 1990, there was a group of um, uh, extreme ultra-nationalists well, we don't hear much about them. That, that's another interesting thing. Uh, ideologically, party like Svoboda, uh, which is now in government in Ukraine, um, and part of the governing coalition, um, is, uh, is um, a more hardline version of the BNP. Um, and it is in government. And we don't hear much about it. Um, uh, now, I mentioned in, um, in one interview that I was giving to, um, uh, to the BBC that in comparison with uh, Svoboda, uh, the BNP in Britain, are like choir boys. Uh, so even, I would say even the National Front of, uh, uh, of past memory did not engage in some except in such exceptional violence as Svoboda or the right sector uh, have engaged in the Ukraine. Yet, it is quite surprising that the media hasn't quite dwelled on that. Uh, and this is something perhaps that will um, crop up in the discussion why it hasn't happened. So we have an extremely um, um, corrupt regime, we have um, an extremely brutal element uh, of the opposition against the regime and um, uh, the regime at some point collapsed, it collapsed um, quite unexpectedly. It's like uh, even the day before the collapse the Polish foreign minister turned to the Ukrainian negotiators and said, if you don't sign up on the dotted line, you will all be dead. Uh, so the regime was fully capable of uh, suppressing um, all, um, uh, all these demonstrations and things. But uh, quite extraordinary, with the mediation of the Polish foreign minister, the German foreign minister, um, uh, the, um, the regime uh, for, for Suk violence. Uh, basically committed itself to withdraw uh, the, the um, uh, Berkut police, uh, special police force, and uh, not to um, um, use any violence against the protesters anymore. So the regime, interestingly enough, enough kept its part of the bargain. The demonstrators, the opposition, did not. Basically, the leaders of the um, uh, of the protest went to the Maidan and presented uh, what the agreement was, a uh, very uh, sort of agreement that was achieved very with uh, great, great efforts and, and European mediation. And the Maidan basically said, we don't care about this agreement. Uh, so um, Yanukovych basically uh, withdrew the police and then he had to flee for his life. He claims he was, um, he was shot at, which is not entirely surprising, uh, bearing in mind what has been happening after that. So the regime fell. Uh, and a rather peculiar <laughs> coalition uh, came to power, where Svoboda would be uh, quite prominent to represent it. <coughs> Having said that, the coalition is essentially uh, manned by centrist parties. It is not uh, can't be described as a neo-fascist government or anything like that. It's basically parties that, um, I wouldn't say a particularly nice bunch of people, they quite often are as corrupt as Yanukovych. We're thinking of Timoshenko, nicknamed uh, uh, the Gas Princess. And then, um, after the, the fall of the regime, we have seen pictures of um, um, Yanukovych's, um, Yanukovych's houses and, and palaces and all that. What we haven't seen is the palaces uh, of some of the leaders of the opposition, people like Timoshenko. I mean, Timoshenko has a house every bit as lavish as Yanukovych, plus a private beach. Um, now, Petro Poroshenko, 
who is one of the most um, um, important oligarchs and actually the, the, the godfather, in a way, of the Maidan protest uh, and, and the person much respected by the democratic or the more democratic parts of the opposition, well, he beats them all because he has a palace that is uh, modeled on the White House. A really lavish thing. Uh, you can find it on the internet uh, if, you, if you do a little bit of searching. So, in terms of corruption, in terms of uh, choosing between Yanukovych and uh, uh, many people in the opposition, there isn't much to choose. Um, in, in, in some ways, Yanukovych was poorer than the guys on the other side. Mm, now, uh, coming back to the government, Svoboda was uh, quite prominently represented. The Minister of Defense was from Svoboda. The chief prosecutor was from Svoboda, um, and some other governments were also from Svoboda. The Minister of Culture, which is very important because Svoboda is much more focused on culture than any other things, and what they understand by culture, we can talk about a bit later. Um, essentially, they want to re-educate the nation, and uh, uh, the half of the nation that still speaks Russian um, will have to be convinced that they have to speak another language, that is Ukrainian. Uh, that's the thrust of uh, what Svoboda wants in the cultural sphere. Mm, it's quite an extraordinary thing. It's like, uh, uh, it's like the Flemish uh, or Flams Belang, for example, which is quite a right-wing party, um, uh, standing up and basically says, we want to re-educate the people in Brussels who are actually Dutchmen or Flemish people, but they have forgotten Flemish and uh, they have to learn Flemish again and they, they don't have to speak French or will make them very, very uncomfortable. That's the type of thing that Svoboda wants to uh, realize in, um, in Ukraine. So that's their cultural, uh, so to say, interest. And um, uh, uh, just very briefly, the attitude to law. Um, now, law is, uh, is a much abused concept um, in, in terms of um, transitions in Eastern Europe, uh, how much respect there has been in the, uh, towards the law. Even in 1989, 90, um, one shouldn't exaggerate too much about the, the depth of the commitment towards, uh, towards the law. But at least in 1989-1990, the opposition, the opposition made the point that the key thing they want is to make the regime respect its own laws. They tried, they made a conscious effort. Uh, it was started uh, in uh, Czechoslovakia, also uh, in the former Soviet Union, all these countries spread around. That was a hallmark of the 1989-99 revolutions. One thing was non-violence, despite extreme provocation uh, on the side of the regime, and these were far nastier regimes than in Kovic. Non-violence, I mean, there was a religious commitment to non-violence. I'm speaking about someone who has actually lived through that period. And there would be guards at meetings and rallies, because, uh, let me assure you about this. There were plenty of people that would have wanted to engage in violence. And this is why the, the people that were the security of the rallies, voluntary security, they were, trying, they were discouraging, actively discouraging, taking these people out, uh, not to allow um, people to be provoked in the rallies. This has been absent in Ukraine. And the other thing that has been absent is the attitude to law, completely, completely and utterly instrumental. Mm, now, no respect for agreements, no respect for anything. I mean, this is, has been quite striking uh, and, and quite amazing. This is, um, I have been watching Ukrainian television uh, quite religiously over the last uh, two months in particular. It comes again and again that there is a complete breakdown of trust. And like uh, what has happened the day before, there is someone from the right sector um, called um, uh, Muzichko who was executed executed. He was executed. He was a bad guy, but I don't think he deserved to be executed. He actually um, um, was, um, um, uh, the Russian government uh, have asked Interpol to, um, uh, to, to um, search for him. So this guy was executed by uh, special police force subordinated to the Minister of the Interior. They, they claimed a few things after that. At first they claimed that he was resisting arrest, uh, shooting at the police, then they claimed that he shot himself dead. Uh, and uh, quite an unlikely story because, well, uh, I mean, you can, you can look it up on the internet and you can make up your mind about this. Uh, he was a bad guy, a thoroughly nasty piece of work. Uh, he's someone who fought on the side of uh, Dudayev's people in the Chechen war. Uh, he was behind torture and execution of tens of um, Russian soldiers and, um, and, and officers. But again, 
is this how a government operates? By executing people, even nasty pieces of work. I mean, I find this profoundly disturbing. And, and, and this, again, uh, just to buttress what I have been saying um, about the, um, this quite exceptional uh, situation in Ukraine, utter disrespect of any law, of any rules, um, and, and as a result of this, complete breakdown of trust. Even within the governing coalition, they, the, gov the parties there have started eating each other up, literally, and we haven't seen the last of it. If you watch how they communicate to each other in the Rada, uh, and there have been plenty of stories, some of them coming um, shyly um, on the back pages of British newspapers. It's like um, Svoboda, a bunch of Svoboda MPs forcing the head of uh, one of the most respected Ukrainian television channels to resign. Um, basically, they went there, beat him to pulp, filmed it like gangsters do. Um, in, in some parts of London and, and, and other parts of the world. They filmed themselves, very proud of that, posted, on the, uh, posted it on YouTube, how they basically beat um, a head of the, uh, of the Ukrainian channel. The guy, he was called Mos Moscovite Trash. Um, he said, I'm not Moscovite, I'm not Russian, I'm Ukrainian. I said, shut up, you, uh, and split um, on that. And there have, been a few, there have been a few cases like this. It's not just one. Um, if it was happening, if it was happening, if the National Front in, in France was doing this, it would be front page news. It would be on the beginning and the end, it would be drummed in our heads uh, minute after minute after minute. Yet, we, don't, we barely hear about this. And this I find very, very strange and very, very peculiar. Why people that are related to parties that are practically ostracized in this country, country are being such prominent role um, in Ukraine. And like um, the leader of uh, Svoboda, uh, he is a very gallant man. For example, when Baroness Ashton visited uh, Ukraine, the other opposition leaders shook hands with uh, Baroness Ashton. Not so Oleg Tyaknibov. He kissed his, her hand. He's a very gallant man. Unless, of course, when his people are beating someone to pulp, uh, then he is not particularly gallant. But um, uh, again, this is this extreme violence that I find personally extremely, extremely shocking. And also I find extremely shocking is how little it has been covered, uh, how little prominence it has been given in this country, in the media, or in the Western media in general. So this extreme violence uh, is the one thing. And uh, the other thing that I already mentioned, the type of regime, the type of demonstrators, the type of confrontation that we have been uh, witnessing in Ukraine. Now, uh, there are plenty of other things to talk about, uh, but I'll leave it at that. Mm, uh, Ukraine, just, just to um, um, uh, make some suggestions for the debate, is Ukraine, contrary to what we often see um, in the media, is a deeply divided country. Yes, we've heard about this, but we haven't heard quite what the division was. Ukraine, effectively, is a country of two nations. One looking east, the other looking west, with completely different heroes, completely different values. And um, for some reason, again, we have been told, well, uh, it's majority ethnic Ukrainian. Yes, it is. These both nations uh, are based on the ethnic Ukrainians, but they're very different nations. So I hope this uh, crops up uh, in um, our conversation. And with this, I would conclude my presentation. Thank you. One can read the events in the Ukraine at many different levels, like anything else in the uh, global affairs. And one can look at the events in a global context uh, and read it as, a, as part of a geopolitical calculation or uh, competition between two, uh, two, two power blocks. Or one can look at the, the, the local aspect and look at the, the nationalism or the, the national identity in, in Ukraine, or uh, as Kirill mentioned, the, nation, the nationalist ide ideologies existing in, in the Ukraine. Or one can look, look at the conflict from a political economy perspective and look at the unemployment figures and where the factories are located mainly in the East and what, and what people are expecting from the European Union, Union economically. So again, uh, one can understand and explain the conflict in at many different uh, different areas, and 
every single of them will be meaningful, and there isn't any one single uh, correct interpretation. So it depends on which level you would like to analyze. So in this following 10, 15 minutes, I'm going to look at two areas. One is the geopolitical aspect uh, in order to justify the subtitle. Uh, and secondly, uh, I, I will look at the, the national uh, ideology or I ideologies existing in the in Ukraine, especially in the second decade of 21st century. What is happening here is a consequence of a multipolar world, uh, where declining powers, declining global powers, and rising and reviving powers are competing for position and interests with potentially dangerous consequences. What we have here is two more or less equal imperialistic camps uh, jockeying for domination and control uh, in the region. The US, Europe, and the NATO military alliance on one side, and Russia as the emerging, uh, reviving uh, power on, on the other side. And both uh, aims can be considered, uh, in one way, uh, imperialistic aims. President Putin and the Russian government, uh, they represent powerful interest groups uh, in Russia who enrich themselves from the dissolution of the Soviet Union by actually stealing former state property. In advancing, in advancing their interests, this elite relies on the promotion of Russian chauvinism, both in Ukraine and in Russia. And it's not only just now, since pro probably before Putin came to power. Therefore, or Russia's Crimea intervention, in my opinion, is not a liberation. Russia is an authoritarian state with imperialist ambitions in its own right. But of course, it will not be fair equating Russia's interests and actions with, the, with those of the NATO countries. One shouldn't lose all sense of proportion and balance. The NATO countries are the key aggressors here in the recent events in Ukraine. By escalating tensions and manipulating and derailing the legitimate protest of the Ukrainian people against their corrupt government, and it is uh, very authoritarian policies. And this is not only just recently. The Western, uh, a, a number of Western governments, uh, through their uh, agencies, they have been doing this since uh, the so-called Orange Revolution since 2004. Ukraine's Orange Revolution in 2004 ha happened heavily on the basis of direct involvement, and so far, by now, many people wrote about this and published documents as a result of direct involvement of key American and Western agencies and extremely large amount of money uh, put uh, in the uh, country. But of course, this so-called Orange Revolution uh, went sour pretty quickly, with the hero of that event, Viktor Yushchenko, quickly discredited and by now almost forgotten. There are, however, now new heroes in, in Kiev, and some of them Kirill mentioned. But of course, seeing all this doesn't justify what uh, the Russian government is doing there. Putin is certainly no saint, a former KGB chief, he has squeezed large amounts of wealth out of Russian economy by treating the country as his personal fiefdom. Uh, but again, one can only see the bigger picture if we take a step back and look at the background of the current conflict. Uh, Stephen Kinzer, a uh, New York Times reporter, uh, recently noted that, I quote, from the moment the Soviet Union collapsed in 1991, the United States has relentlessly pursued a strategy of encircling Russia. US military power is now directly on Russia's borders. And another journalist, Jonathan Steele, again recently mentioned uh, the same uh, point in The Guardian by saying that, I quote, underlying the crisis in Ukraine and Russia's fierce resistance to potential changes is NATO's undisguised ambition to continue two decades of expansion into what used to be called as post-Soviet space. The story we hear from uh, the majority of the media 
in the West can be summarized in, in just a few words. People of Ukraine revolted against their tyrannical government supported by Russia. And in response, uh, the Russian great power uh, invaded and uh, annexed the Crimean Peninsula. None of this information, uh, which is uh, every single day reproduced in the mainstream media, however, deals with the actual roots of the conflict. The real story of what's happening in Ukraine is somewhat more complicated than the little morality tale being staged and restaged by the mainstream media. In short, again, as Kirill touched very, very rightly, the situation in Ukraine is that of a country comprised of two groups, two distinct groups, Western Ukrainians and Eastern Ukrainians. Politically, culturally, economically, and psychologically, two different groups. Historically, these two groups of people have never had much in common, and they never will. Western Ukraine has strong ties to Poland and other neighbors to the West, while Eastern Ukraine is closely tied to Russia. These two groups have almost exactly opposite views on the way the country should be run. This complete and strong division of the country is what led to the current as well as past instabilities and crises in, in the country. No matter who comes to power, one half of the country will be against him or her. Now I will talk briefly about the idea of nationalism uh, in this recent conflict, uh, especially in this uh, second decade of 21st century. Uh, I would like to read a, a paragraph which was published recently in Open Democracy by Anton Shekostov. I believe it's a Ukrainian name. Uh, I quote, We call upon all those who have either no particular interest for or no deeper knowledge of Ukraine to not comment on this region's complicated national questions without engaging in some in-depth research. Reporters who have the necessary time, energy, and resources should visit Ukraine. Those who are unable to do so may want to turn their attention to other, more familiar, uncomplicated, and less ambivalent topics. This should help to avoid in the future the unfortunate numerous cliches, factual errors, and misinformed opinions that often accompany discussions of events in Ukraine. This is quite common uh, recently presented by Ukrainian authors who support uh, the protest uh, movement. So if you uh, don't understand, and also it's very difficult to understand because this is so complicated, this is so different, this is so unique, then you shouldn't comment on that. Of course, this is very typical as well. All nationalisms present themselves exactly in the same words. Uh, today, in the second decade of the 21st century, the issue of accommodating national identity within the existing constitutional structures presents a serious global challenge. This proves particularly demanding given the often conflicting <coughs> political goals of minority and majority groups within one state, and many states are like that. Minorities seek a realignment of state borders, either through secession or irredentism, while majority groups become the target of nationalist politicians who urge consolidation of the state and the prioritization of the dominant ethnic group. Crises of national identity come to the fore in many contemporary disputes. Ukraine is not the first or, 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 or will not be the last. And in a number of instances, attempts to assert or reinforce ideals of national identity have not only resulted in the breakdown of constitutional order, but have also led to serious violations of individual and collective rights, as we witnessed recently in, in Kiev. There are tragic cases, uh, such as those Rwanda, Bosnia-Herzegovina, Kosovo, Chechnya, and many others. Nationality, according to this kind of understanding of nationalism is a very unique, very specific, uh, very geographic area specific entity, is often thought of as something natural or pre-social. So one may consider that Turks are different from Kurds, uh, 
or Russians different from Ukrainians in the way that the fish of the Mediterranean are different from those of the Black Sea. This sense of naturalness is reinforced by stories nations often have about their own past. Nationalists often think of their nation in ways influenced by a traditional model of a pure or ideal case. The ideal version is of people inhabiting a single unified territory. And according to this view, the, the people are a tribe. They are a single ethnic group. They speak the same common language, share the common history, common culture, and most of the time, they share the same religious uh, ideas. It is taken for granted in most countries that the obvious way to exist is as a nation state. In the 19th century, the idea spread that states should be based around separate nations. This was often presented as a natural development. Uh, but as Ernest Gellner observed in his seminal book, Nations and Nationalism, I quote, nations like states are a contingency and not a universal necessity. Today, of course, the concept seems so well entrenched that it is rarely questioned. But you only need to look at the map of the world to see how inappropriate, if not crazy, it is to apply this understanding of nation state uh, to many parts of the uh, world. The idea of a nation state does not work well in many countries like Afghanistan, Uzbekistan, many parts of Africa, uh, even in Western Europe. Is there any solution? The obvious answer is that we should simply back away from our obsession with nation states and recognize that political structures can be multi-ethnic and that decision making is often best exercised in more federal uh, constructions. The great irony of the 21st century world is that even as national borders look increasingly odd, out of time, nationalism as an ideology remains a very strong uh, way to identify uh, oneself in many contexts. And nation state still derives both expansionist moves in Russia and the protest movement in places like Ukraine. And that is the tragedy, not just in Ukraine, but in so much of the world. Thank you. Yes, yes. <coughs> right. Well, th thanks for asking me. It's nice to uh, it's it's nice to be here. I thought I would um, mostly um, it, what would be useful would be for me to talk about this more from a Russian perspective and talk about why um, um, the Putin regime has got to the point where it's done what it's done. As a, as a, this is a vital part of the conversation that we need to have. But I just wanted to make a few observations about. Uh, about what's happened in Ukraine first. Um, I, I, I just wanted to say, I mean, I, I found most of what you had to say, Kirill, very persuasive, but I, I, I think I really wanted to make one additional point, which is that I, I, I agree that the revolution wasn't 1989, and I agree that it wasn't 1989 for all the reasons, for all the vital reasons that you stated. But I, I, I just wonder, you know, maybe we can come back to this in, 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 in discussion, whether... Um, by only stressing the violence, you actually are missing out some of the other really important and interesting things that, that did happen during, the event, during those events. I mean, one thing that really strikes me, for example, is how multinational the protests, um, uh, the protests were. You know, they were, they were the first, uh, the, first um, uh, the person who started the Maidan protests was actually an Afghan. And, um, and uh, yes, 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 and uh, um, we were limited and, by time, so yeah, I, yeah, I couldn't sure, present the sure. and, 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 and of course, um, and of course, the, the nature of the movement was very much bringing together the full spectrum of, um, of, of, of politics in, in well, maybe not the full spectrum, but a, no, perhaps a better way would be saying a wide spectrum of politics in uh, in, in Ukraine. So, for example, um, uh, um, the uh, phone line. The Yanukovych regime. Um, uh, one of its tactics was it would just kind of pick up, um, uh, pick up protesters, and they just disappear, and so uh, um, and never to be seen again. And some of the bodies have been found. And, and, and one of the um, 
one of the phone lines for the people who were who were trying to um, support the relatives of the uh, of the disappeared were manned by gay activists, for example, and um, and feminist activists were actually guarding some of the people in the hospitals, and so and so you know there was a kind of sense in which it was. You know, I, I mean, there were these foul elements, but there was, but, but, it, but yeah, it's kind of funny kind of rainbow coalition, really. Rainbow with black edges. Or something <coughs> like that, I don't know. So I just wanted to really, I, I wanted to really make that um, comment. Second thing I'd like to say about, about Ukraine, I, I mean, again, I'm, I'm, I'm very sorry, I don't even agree with much of what both, both the previous speakers said, but the, the, sort of, the problem of, post, of, of Ukrainian politics in the, in, in, in the post-communist period, well, many problems, Kirill focused on the oligarchs, and rightly so, but, but the, how difficult, how policy, I remember Barrington Moore's great, great writing on, on the, the, the development of democracy, where he talks about how politics um, really um, has to, you know, democratic politics can only emerge when politics is on a manageable spectrum, where, where there isn't um, a sort of a sort of bath, uh, uh, politics is not conducted between groups who have fundamentally different views about what the political community is, um, and about who should belong to it and what its borders should be, and so on and so forth. And in a way, a lot of the problems with with with, with Ukraine have been have have been simply because it's it's it's. it's it, it, it's not been possible, well, it simply hasn't been on a manageable spec spectrum. I mean, understandably, Ukrainian nationalism um, is strongly anti-Russian because of certain um, facts about Ukrainian history, which it prioritises. And obviously, the most important one is the memory of the early 1930s and the Holland and War and the Harvest of Sorrow. Um, and um, and of course the account of the history, um, the the account of history in the national uh, the account of that in the nationalist account was this was a crime by Russians against Ukrainians, where as opposed to the as opposed to a crime by um, a, a particular totalitarian regime against all citizens of the um, uh, well, not citizens all the inhabitants of the Soviet Union. Um, so, so, um, um, but again, of course, so, so from the point of view of the Western Ukraine and Eastern Ukraine, where where the sort of foci of identification as the statues of Lenin in the um, in the um, uh, um, uh, in, in in the town squares and so on, you know, this is the statue of the dictator who's caused the people's suffering. So, so, uh, um, so, no wonder this has been the, 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 no wonder the politics has been. Uh, has been difficult. Um, uh, I, I, okay, so I, I wanted to say that, and just one more point about Ukraine before I want to talk, to, to talk a bit about Putin. Um, I, I think um, what nevertheless is clear is that, is that Ukraine has developed a kind of sense um, over, over the period since 1991 that it is, a, the, the, uh, or at least there is an aspiration for it to be a single political um, community, and we certainly know before um, before all of the uh, all of the events of um, of um, the last few months um, that um, I mean, that the, the polls done openly asking asking people in various parts of Ukraine would you do you, you want to remain a part of Ukraine and uh, I think even in Crimea only forty one percent said they didn't want to remain part of Ukraine. The, the numbers in the numbers in the um, main Ru uh, Russian-speaking regions in the southeast, in Donetsk and um, and um, Kharkiv and so on, were sort of um, 15, 20 percent who, who were who were looking east rather than saying no, we actually want to uh, um, uh, uh, want to want to stay part of this country. Um, so um, so. Um, and and I suppose I suppose from the point of view of where we are now, it seems to me that what we what we really need to be focusing on is means of 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 kind of consolidating that that the, the, that 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 notion of Ukraine as a kind of single political community to the extent that it's possible. And I mean, Kirill, you know, your your presentation is pretty pessimistic from that point po 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 point of view. But I mean, it seems to me that there are things that could be done which would. Um, 
which would um, which would really encourage that. And clearly, I think Bullen said about the fed about about deep federalisation of the country, and that's clearly something which I think it will be important to pressure the. It, it, it would be important to push the new regime um, towards. Um, and neutrality, I think, is another really important issue here. I think that um, I, I sort of, um, uh, Kirill the article that you wrote last week, you mentioned Brzezinski's um, and, Kissinger. And, Kissinger, uh, and Kissinger talking about the Finlandization yep. of Ukraine. And, I, and, and, and a couple of Ukrainian ambassadors have said similar things as well. I think, I, I, I think um, it, it, it's, it's important to find some... Um, s some uh, kind of consensus about about um, ab about this. I mean, Putin in his speech, one of the one of the points that he one of the points that he made. I mean, quite quite you know, in his in a kind of paranoid fantasy. But he said, what we don't want is NATO soldiers in Sevastopol, and this is what it's all about. And I, I mean, uh, I, I but I think we don't need NATO soldiers in Sevastopol. So. Um, uh, okay, so so probably probably. I'll, um, there's more I could say, but I'd, li I'd really like to talk about Putin a bit more because I, I think what the, the we've we've seen in the last um, um, we've seen in the last um, six months, and obviously most intensely in the last month or so, a, a, a kind of real change in the nature of Russian politics. Um, uh, and I was rather struck by a blog which our former colleague Mark Galliotti wrote um, a couple of weeks ago, where he said, actually, this is Putin 3.0. Um, um, we had Putin 1.0, um, and Putin 1.0 was a, was a regime which was actually operating um, on, um, with, with quite a wide basis of support. Um, and this was because um, it was doing what Kirill was referring to and pretend, or, well, and pretending to uh, uh, clamp down on the excesses of the uh, of the uh, um, Yeltsin period. Although I would say that it didn't fundamentally change the oligarchic system and hasn't. Uh, it's just that Putin expropriated certain oligarchs and appointed ones who were closer to who were who were closer to him and and more invisible and less and, and with less public conspicuous consumption but anyway that's you know, that's uh, you know we can we can argue about that later but uh, but so 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 um but obviously putin 1.0 was was this was a regime which was um I mean, you can look at the manipulations by which it was, uh, b b by which people, b b by by which people were um, um, uh, were uh, uh, encouraged to, to to support him, but it was a regime which which had um, a sort of broad um, broad based support across many of the sections of Russian. Uh, of uh, Russian society, and and that and that that political strength, obviously he used in various ways domestically to undermine. Well, he he was, was to cl close down a free. Well, not not it wasn't an end to free media. There is there is a free press in in Russia even ish even today. But television was brought back under state control and uh, and to, and made to toe the Kremlin. Uh, Kremlin line. Obviously, in Putin, in this version of the Putin regime, he also he also uh, um, took the opportunity to undermine the kind of proto democratic regimes that uh, institutions, sorry, which had which had emerged in the nineteen nineties in Russia, and uh, and this was justified by the various sorts of security threats that he that he saw. So he try so he tries in this his, his his language at this time is he's establishing this kind of power vertical, this strong hand which will which will which which will kind of. Um, uh, over uh, will, will will enable Russia to solve all the problems which had emerged during the chaos of the uh, 1990s. But in relation to the outside world, Putin is very much trying to um, trying to. Well, he wants to be at, he wants to be at the table. He wants to be part of the world system, and we see that in all kinds of ways. You know, it's, it's so so Russia becomes involved in various kind of international uh, international organisations. Obviously, the G7 becomes the G8, and uh, and um, um, even Russia and NATO even begin to cooperate with joint with observation of each other's military exercises and 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 so forth. Um, Russia is part of the of the um, European Court of Human Rights, sort of. 
it becomes a member of the World Trade Organization and so on. So, so it's it um, so 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 um, uh, and and so Putin Putin the the, the Putin one point zero um, uh, uh, is is a, is a is a sort of is a success for the first couple of terms of his presidency, and, and this fundamentally because of the oil price, because uh, because the economy Putin inherits the perfect economic. Um, uh, uh, perfect economic situation. The oil price is shooting up, and he's able to use that to restore all sorts of. Uh, I mean, we had we were in a situation where the, the welfare system was collapsing, the health system was collapsing, and, uh, and 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 he's able to deal with some of, address some of those problems. And he's also really, I mean, I think the key thing to understand with the first version of Putin is he succeeds so much and he becomes so popular because he makes Russia into a consumer society for the first time. You know, this is, this is, um, uh, um, um, uh, so, so, so he's able to dramatically, positively improve the standards of living. Um, Putin 2.0, um, Putin 2.0 from about 2008. Um, it's where the contradictions of the system that he's built um, begin to show themselves. Um, and obviously, also from 2008, you've got the, pro the the effects within Russia of the of the global financial crisis. So economic growth from being seven or eight percent a year falls to almost nothing, and it's, a, it's kind of crept along at one or two percent in the period since since then. But more importantly, the, the contradictions in the political system which Putin has created become more and more apparent within Russia. Um, the difficulties of this power vertical in actually controlling what's been, uh, what, 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 what's going on within the country. Um, and there are, I, I mean, there are, so I can justify that a bit more by talking about particular incidents which really illustrated the fact that, that it was very clear that this system wasn't working. Um, uh, and 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 um, and that that um, the, and also I suppose that far from being the, the the kind of the kind of president above the fray who's kind of uh, um, who, who's who's able to who's able to be the sort of tough guy who sorts out all the problems. Okay, um, yeah, I better whiz, whiz on. Um, um, actually, Putin is really kind of got his hands dirty, just like everybody else in the system, and and really. That the opposition, the crit criticisms from the opposition about how corrupt Putin and the circle uh, around him are really begin to hit home. And in particular, the opposition uh, blogger Alexei Navalny, his phrase, I don't know how many Russians have heard of Navalny, but his phrase about Putin's organisation, United Russia, that this is the party of crooks and thieves, really kind of resonates. And, uh, and, um, and um, I. I, I, I he, the Medvedev period kind of postpones the crisis. Um, it's a very shrewd move. I can expand on that again if you want. Um, but um, the end of the Medvedev period and Putin returning to the presidency drastically changes Russian politics um, uh, because it, changes, it, it very much narrows his support base. It, it, it means that the, those, those elements of his support that hoped that he could modernise, that he could deal with corruption, that he could, that he could change the Russian economy, um, uh, that, that, that he could solve the kind of efficiency problems of the Russian economy and so on, they lose, they, 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 lose, they lose faith in him. And what it means is that his kind of support base and his, and, and his kind of, and, um, it, it, um, yeah, his, base, his, his support base within the Kremlin becomes much more narrow, much more that group in Russian politics, which is the secure, the Siloviki, the, the people, the security, um, uh, the, the security forces. And I think what we see there is Putin's kind of real, true mindset beginning, be, be, becoming increasingly clear. Um, and so we see this kind of pattern of increasing anti-Western rhetoric. I mean, um, and, and, and the three key issues being NATO expansion, NATO operating out of area, the missile defence system, that, that we see this kind of massive ratcheting up of anti-Western rhetoric, um, 
within the Russian media. Putin's very angry about the, the way that the Olympics is presented in, in, in the West. He's very angry about how, uh, about how Western leaders don't, don't come to Sochi and so forth. Um, in relation to Ukraine, I think he's very much taken by surprise, like, a, like most people with the revolution, because revolutions by their nature are surprising. But he hates, I mean, he is by nature, he is by instinct a counter-revolutionary. Um, and so I think he takes a snap decision to do what he's always wanted to do um, uh, when, he, when he decides to, uh, when he decides to um, uh, occupy Crimea. Um, and I think um, we, we see some really, I do recommend if you haven't read Putin's speech that he made to both Houses of Parliament um, in, of, the, of the State Duma that you do. But he's beginning to use language which is kind of fairly striking. So, so I just wanted to, to, um, to make two final points um, uh, about the sort of language that he's using to justify the, 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 the land grab. Um, first of all, about Ukrainian nationhood, um, he says, we are not just close neighbours, we are essentially, as I have said more than once, a single people. Ukrainians are no different to Russians, is, is now the rhetoric from, from Putin. And secondly, in relation to the borders, um, the borders with... Um, uh, um, uh, he says about, about the way that the border between Russia and Ukraine was drawn, he says the Bolsheviks, let God be their judge, incorporated considerable parts of Russia's historical south into Soviet Ukraine without taking account of the ethnic composition of these regions. And now this is the present day southeast of Ukraine. So he's saying very clearly this is Russia. This is not Ukraine. Um, I think I'm out of time, so Thanks very much. more points. Thanks very much for sharing your insights with us.